So when it came to Enjoy the Silence and the Violator record in general, did you personally work on Dave's vocals with the producer, Flood? We did all the vocals apart from Personal Jesus. Okay, interesting. Um, and how is David to work with as a vocalist in studio? Is there anything unique about his approach? How do you? How is it like working with him? Well, certainly when we when we were there, we did all kinds of different things. We had the classic setup of you know mic- microphone and a shield and headphones and whatever. We did that. You know, Alan wanted Alan in particular, and obviously with Flood, they wanted a certain kind of vocal approach on certain things. So it was like, well, let's get a fifty-eight. You know, let's get a, a sure microphone. You know, like mm-hmm. just because of this. You know and just get him to sing in the control room. So we, we, we set it up so Dave could sing, you know, kind of live, if you want, mm-hmm. in the control room. We did another one where we had, you know, the classic stage monitors in the studio on the floor, mm-hmm. Dave singing on a, again on a, on a 58. I think, you know, they, they definitely pushed him, I thought. But I think the results were, were, were great and Dave, Dave's a fantastic vocalist you know he's definitely got his own style he's a brilliant front man but they were definitely pushing him you know to try and get the results and the style of stuff that that um you know they Flood and Alan in particular had in their head interesting was he more of like a one to take kind of guy or would he go on for several takes until they get the thing that they want we used to do kind of you know we'd run through the whole song and then we definitely go back and do certain phrases uh, and, and go over bits and pieces. I mean, like with any vocalist, I, I don't think there's a cut and dried method. It depends on how you perceive that you're going to get the best results. And of course, I mean, you know, Alan had done how many albums by then with Depeche? Um, he'd been in a band like 10 years. So there was definitely a, an open mindedness to to vary up the approach with Dave. I thought he was great in the studio. You know, he was really open-minded and performed brilliantly. But I mean, like everyone, I mean, you know, you can only sing for so long, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and because you lose, you lose, it's like play, playing any instrument. I mean, you can only do it for, you know, a couple of hours before, you know, you kind of wear out and lo- lose that kind of edge. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, he was a total professional, yeah. Interesting. So why did you guys choose to record Dave sometimes with a handheld microphone? The microphone thing, the 50, you know, what we called an SM58, um, mm-hmm. it's the style of mic that uh, most vocalists, even now, you know, then even now would use live. You tend to just perform differently when you've got a mic in your hand and you're listening back to, to speakers because... Most of the time, vocalists don't wear headphones. They only really wear headphones when in the studio. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you've ever tried it yourself, but <laughs> you know, if you sing with headphones on, your pitching is, is, it takes a while for you to kind of get your pitching together. A lot of vocalists have one ear on, one ear off, kind of, you know, like yeah, this. Yeah. Um, because it's a, you isolate the vibrations in your head and the sound and it just, you, you just sound different. Um, and it's quite an alien environment, really. So to those who don't do it, it's quite difficult to understand what a big change that is. It's all about the performance at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, it's like you can have the best snare drum sound in the world, but if the song's crap, then it's not going to make any difference, is it? So it's the same thing. They were always conscious of trying to get that emotion, get that vibe, get it on the record. They was very conscious of that. So uh, it, it never f- bothered me. You know, a lot of engineers would go, oh, you know, what about, you know, you can hear the, the what they call the spill. You know, you can hear the backing track on the mic and stuff. It didn't bother me at all. You know, it was, once you get it in the out, once you get it in the record and you get the mix up, I'm like, it's like, no, you know, it, it, it's fine. Hmm. And in fact, just another quick story is when we ended up doing the devotional tour, mm-hmm. we, we did a, a live video. It was going to be a double live album, but it, it ended up just being, you know, Songs of Faith and ended up just being, you know, but it, was, <laughs> it ended up Songs of Faith and Devotion live. And in the live video, we went to Olympic and, you know, did the usual thing of set Dave up with headphones. And we did a few takes on some of the songs like that because obviously you know with, with live sometimes it's so much noise and the spill was just so big that the vocal sound did suffer a little bit 
And so you can kind of, most people just do a little bit of cheating along the way. And it just, it didn't quite sound the same. So I said to Al, well, just get him to use a 58, you know, like he does live. Just do that. That's cool. And most of the vocals came that way um, for that. Um, so it's a technique I still use now, actually. Some of the engineers I've spoken to have said that they'll have vocalists they work with that they'll go for 20 minute periods and they'll take a break. They'll go back for 20 more minutes, take a break. Some vocalists will go for like three hours straight and then stop. Do you remember what more or less was his approach? How could I say? I, I think it was until they felt that they had enough material to put then a composite vocal together and think, okay, right, we've got that. We've got that we've got a version of this. We've got a version of the second verse. We've got, you know, six, seven versions of, 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 you know, choruses and stuff. And then it would be, it was Alan and I would sit down and he'd have, I, you know, it was all on analog at the time. So you, I'd play back all the different takes and he'd make his mark. And then he'd say, okay, I want, you know, the first half of the verse from take three and I want the second half of the verse from take five. And I'd be sitting there, you know, on the desk, running the faders up and down. We'd put a composite together. Obviously, I mean, the producer was Flood. Alan is the main production head in the band, if you want. So the two of them very, very you know, led, 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 the, uh, led the strategy on that. So, you know, we'd put this, uh, these takes together, um, playing back to Dave. Some songs we redid. Some takes, you know, were, were done in a different kind of way, as I said, you know, with a microphone in his hand or, you know, with, with the stage monitors. There's lots of different things that were, that were, were done for mm -hmm. production reasons. I mean, I think, you know, me personally, I liked the idea that it was more about the the sound and the emotion rather than getting, you know, the the, the best vocal sound in the world. I wouldn't say that the vocal sound is bad at all, actually, but uh, it didn't bother me or it didn't bother the guys that instead of using this, you know, 20,000 pound Telefunken, whatever, or a Neumann, um, that we'd end up on a Shaw 58. You know, it was more to do with, with the emotional side of it, um, which was something that I found really interesting considering that they were and still are, you know, an electronic band. So you'd think that they want everything, you know, in a square box and precise, but that wasn't the case. Hmm, interesting. One of the things to me that's interesting about Violator is that there's five different studios in four different countries credited as where the record yeah. was made. So, I mean, there's two different ones in London that was made, um, that where it was recorded. Yeah. How much of the record was recorded in London and how much of it was recorded outside? Personal Jesus was already finished and mixed. I believe uh, it was mixed in Milan by, and I know it was mixed by Francois Kevorkian. Um, they'd been to Puck, which is this amazing studio in, in Denmark, kind of in the middle of nowhere. They'd started most of the songs. So Enjoy the Silence was was, was already there. Person of Jesus was already there. Um, no, not Person of Jesus, the Policy of Truth. They're all, you know, the bare structures were already in place. And the idea was, um, you know, like talking to the band was, well, we, you know, we've got overdubs to finish, we've got tracks to finish, but, you know, we've got vocals to do. And I think it kind of went on for about two months. I was only supposed to be there a couple of weeks, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's usually how it happens. You know, yeah. like, you know, seven years later, I'm still working with the band. But, um, yeah, so, I, you know, the, these tracks would come out. I mean, you know, we did a lot of work. I remember on Switch Perfection, the rolling drums that, you know, Alan played that, sampled it, put that in. As I say, you know, it, it's a while ago now, but I, I remember you know, the bare bones of, of most of the tracks. So we did the Toms on Clean, I remember. We did, you know, some stuff on Joy to Silence. We did stuff on all the tracks. That's cool. So what was it like working on Policy of Truth? It was cool because I remember the conversation over the snare drums in the track, because there's actually two snare drums on that, and then the riff, da -da -down, da -da -bow, that one. You know, Alan, you know, his emu sampler, which was, you know, then it was, even then it was quite clunky, you know, the huge kind of floppy disk and everything and mm -hmm. fiddling around with, with stuff. And then he's like, oh, I want this, you know. So I said, well, why don't you play it, you know. So I think you got out a guitar and kind of did a little thing. We sampled it. And, and then that's how the, I remember him sitting there, you know, going, da -da -da, you know, and then the riff appeared. I was mm -hmm. like, that's 
great. You know, that's really, that's, that's great. Um, so, you know, it's fun developing those songs was, 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 was really cool. Cause they, the other thing is, is that there weren't any, uh, dead rubbers as they say in, you know, in, in, in London, you know, there weren't any songs who went, Oh, I don't really like that one very much. I, I thought they, they, and I'm very biased, <laughs> but I just thought, you know, all the tracks on there were great, you know, and every time you get the track up, you go, this is a, this is a really good song. And then, and I remember listening back, we did some like rough mixes. Um, I did them and, and, you know, Flood was around, Alan was around and we kind of, you know, knocked it kind of rough into shape, did the rough mixes of the song. And I remember sitting down, listening to the rust before, um, you know, the, the mixing started with Francois and I, I, I thought, you know what, this is a really good record. 